Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out the radio version of the show every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern on WDJY 99.1 in Atlanta. We also air on a podcasting network in Los Angeles called the 405 Media. There's a TV version of the show that airs on KMVT 15 in Silicon Valley at 8 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday nights. Both versions of the show air in other states. For these show times plus past episodes, please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Laura Patricelli. She's a creative director and brand strategist at Design Mastermind NYC. Laura, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think what you're doing is is really interesting and cool and the journey that you kind of went on to get to where you are now is inspiring but maybe before we kind of get into all that fun stuff let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up sure that sounds good uh so originally i'm from southwest florida which when i was growing up was pretty much populated with the retirees from chicago and the northeast So it was pretty lonely. It was just a lot of old retired people moving down to Naples to uh, basically it's called heaven's waiting room for a reason. (laughs) Um, But being an only child, it kind of gave me an opportunity to just develop my creative spirit and develop a sense of of interest apart from social interests. So I got into journal keeping, drawing. Uh, I actually was digging through some of my old photos the other day and found my very first Photoshop attempt from the year 1999. And it was spectacularly horrible (laughs) in all the best ways. It was like a word art explosion. (laughs) Nice. I... But it, it also felt it gave me a, a greater sense of connection to who I was when I was in Florida. This I loved color and sunshine, and it really just sort of allowed me to become the creative that I am today. It gave me that space to develop creativity without a whole bunch of people around to play with. I would just play with my computer. No, that's that's really cool. So. You, you went to university. Walk us through that journey because you kind of switched majors, but walk us through that journey. So going into college, I was convinced that the only creative field that I could get into that was super lucrative, that was practical, quote unquote, uh, was architecture because okay. it was creative. It involved design. Nobody told me anything about graphic design. I did not even realize that that was a career path, even though I had been reading magazines forever, but I didn't think of it as a really viable career option. Sure. And I slogged through two years as an, as an architecture major. And even though it was fun, it just started to get very formulaic. Uh, the science behind architecture started to overshadow the creative side of actually designing. And I realized that if I did want to be an architect, I was going to have to basically just struggle through years of pipe drawings uh, without actually developing that creative um, style that I wanted to develop as, as a creative person. So a friend of mine just turned to me one day. We were driving down to South Beach for a sunny Miami afternoon. And she just said, yeah, you know, I'm sick of, uh, I think she was an English major. She said, I'm sick of writing. I decided I'm going to change my major to graphic design and I want to move to New York one day because that's the city of design. And I looked at her, I'm just like, oh man, like that's a fantastic goal. (laughs) I think I'm going to steal that. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) And I... Yeah, I switched my major the very next day. I was like, uh, I I knew, like, as soon as she said it, I was like, why didn't I think of that before? Sometimes it's you need those moments of clarity to really um, push you in the direction that you're meant to go in. Totally. Okay, so you you switch majors, then obviously you you completed your, your degree. What did you end up kind of getting a degree in? 
So it's um, it's called a Bachelor of Fine Arts, and okay. you can choose a concentration. So in a fine arts degree, you have all different concentrations, sculpture, um, glass work, et cetera. I, do- I did a double concentration in photography and graphic design because okay. right from the start, I could – I could see how photography went hand in hand with graphic design. And if I wanted to become a successful graphic designer, I was going to need to know as much as I could about photography. And I also wanted a little bit of a bit of a fallback plan in case I absolutely hated working as a graphic designer. Um, So having that degree in photography, uh, even though I didn't end up becoming any sort of studio or fashion photographer, it did give me an understanding of how photography goes into design and why it matters so much. And I actually am able to work with my clients today on producing the best photography for their websites and having that second concentration really gave me um, gave me a leg up on sure. the competition in the world of graphic design. Sure, and then just being able to like talk to the photographer and say, "I want to capture this kind of vibe or look or, or whatever," you know what I mean? But which well, I, and knowing what is possible. Yeah, as that's well. also true, right? Because within a certain budget, right? Like, yeah, no fair. That's interesting. So. You, you get out of school, walk me through your career and, and kind of maybe some failures and highlights up until kind of what you're doing now. <laughs> well, my initial failure after I graduated was not being able to secure a full-time job okay. without a substantial portfolio. Sure. Um, the downside to double getting a double concentration is that I didn't have – a super robust portfolio in either photography or graphic design because I was kind of bouncing all over the place and trying to just develop my sense of style by trying all the things. Um, So when it came down to trying to stay in Miami and actually get a full-time job there, it was really difficult. I totally failed. Um, In fact, I think part of that was the fact that I was only a conversational Spanish speaker. Um, The fact that I was not fluent in Spanish actually disqualified me from most of the jobs that were available in my, uh, in my industry in Miami, because all of the clients that I would have to deal with at an agency job, they were all Spanish speaking clients from Central and South American countries, so it was it was really hard for me to make it in Miami, and I honestly never felt like Miami was my city anyway. Okay. I felt sort of um, pushed to the side. It's a very superficial city, very machismo, very um, uh, appearance heavy. Okay. Whereas I do feel like New York is all about what you do and ha- what you can prove to the world instead of what you look like. Um, but I uh, had to move back home and, and work for Abercrombie and Fitch Corp for a couple years just sure. as a, as a store, as a store manager. Um, actually, fortunately I only had to do that one year because that was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but after saving up enough money, I, and networking a bunch up North because a bunch of my friends who I had gone to UM with, they were from the Northeast. Okay. So after saving up a bunch of money and living with my parents for a little bit, I was able to just ditch everything back in Florida and move to New Jersey. You would think I would move to New York right away, but uh, again, part of the failure. Um, A girlfriend of mine who I had taken design classes with at Miami was looking for a partner to start a freelance company. Okay. And of course, being the fresh-faced idealist that I, you know, was and sort of still am, uh, I was like, oh yeah, I could, I could learn as I go. I can just dive right in and know how to get clients and tackle freelance projects. And I did learn as I, as I went, I learned web design and coding Um, back in those days. This was before WordPress was, uh, you know, took over a third of the internet. And I actually would develop websites from scratch using CSS and HTML. Um, And I also developed flash websites uh, yep. using action scripts yeah, back when yep. flash was king. Yep. Um, 
And even though I ultimately failed and did not know how to get new clients, I was completely isolated because I was in New Jersey and I wasn't from New Jersey, so I didn't really have a huge network there. I had sold my car to move up north for some reason because, hey, I'm right next to the city. I could just take buses and trains everywhere when in reality the only buses and trains in New Jersey go into New York. Right, right. (laughs) So unless I was going into the city, it was really hard for me to get around. And it put a huge strain on my friendship with my business partner. Uh, We ended up absolutely hating each other and uh, just completely wrecking each other's lives. And it was just unfortunate. You know, it's what happens when you're inexperienced and you jump into something without really knowing what it involves sure. and what it takes to make it on your own as a freelancer. And also being in a new place, living outside of Florida for the first time in my life, it was essentially the perfect storm of awfulness. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, just, well, I was just going to say to wrap that up. Yeah, yeah, keep um, going. I was convinced that I had failed completely and was planning on moving back to Florida. And a good friend of mine who was living in Brooklyn at the time, we were going out in the city one weekend and he basically just yelled at me and said, Laura, what what are you doing? Like you think that working with your friend is and trying to freelance is all there is to do in this city. You haven't even tried Uh, Put a portfolio site up, get a real job, work for someone else for a little bit. And I needed that. Sometimes it takes a friend to just kick you in the butt to make you realize, oh, you're right. This isn't all there is. This isn't a failure. This is just an opportunity for me to try something else and to use me living in this city or at least near this city already um, to move on to my next big thing. So I started applying for jobs and creating a portfolio site with the projects that I had been working on with my freelance partner. And I got the first job I applied for as a flash developer. Wow. Um, I, I went in for the interview. They liked my personality. Um, but they didn't like that. I didn't have a whole lot of experience. So, uh, and this is huge for anyone out there listening who is try- is fresh out of college and maybe trying to figure out how to get a design job, you got to follow up and ask for a project. This is yeah, the time when advice. free work really means a lot because that's what got me this job. I followed up, I asked for a project, he said, create a, a, a little game, like a banner game. You know those old advertising yeah, 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 banners totally. that you would see on the side of websites? Yep. He said, make one of these. This is what we do. So I spent five days relearning action script because it had been over a year since I had, I had learned that in college and just blew it out of the park. And that's what got me into uh, corporate. <laughs> no, that's, that's actually really good advice. And I think the other thing I would add to that is, yeah, like ask for a project. But I, I think, too, even doing personal projects and putting them in your portfolio at least has worked for me in the past, right? Because they don't – Oh, yeah. You know, like they want to see – sometimes that can actually – like it doesn't really matter if it's necessarily for a client. Like it helps, obviously. Mm-hmm. But but I think that's also right. worked for me, right? And you can build a portfolio between just like asking for for work and, and like it's hard to turn down somebody's like they obviously know roughly how long you spent on, on that, you know, little flash banner game, yes. right? Like and mm-hmm. they can tell that you were passionate and you really wanted that job, right? Where I think sometimes especially people coming into school is like, Well, I'm not gonna do that. It's like, well then the person that is willing to do that is gonna get the job over you. Oh, yeah. And it also goes back to Cialdini's um, principles of influence. And one of the the main principles that he talks about, and he actually references 
the Hare Krishnas and them okay. giving a flower or a little treat, and then people give back five times what you've given them. So if you provide something at no cost, if you provide that little project or a piece of design that you, they can tell you spent a lot of time on, they're going to pay you back at least fivefold, sure. tenfold in this case. I mean, I got a full-time job. I was able to move into a studio apartment on the Upper East Side of Manhattan within a month of thinking I had totally failed. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's, that's, that's actually like a quick recovery, right? From being kind of on such a low <laughs> to going to like a total high, right? Within a month. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I mean, yeah. I mean, it can flip, it can change so fast. I know. That's the thing I think that we kind of forget, especially in the digital space is like mm -hmm. things move so quickly. And sometimes you can have uh, multiple highs and lows in, in one day, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So. Oh, exactly. Especially when you're working on multiple projects. Yeah, that's also true. So I'm curious. And so, so you've worked at this company for a while. Walk me through kind of how you transitioned into kind of leaving that company into doing your own thing. So it was a lot of luck and a lot of just putting myself in front of the right people. Okay. So the job that I, that I had was um, an interactive designer. So I designed games, little phone games, um, flash games. It was super fun. Obviously not what I wanted to be doing with the rest of my life. Uh, I did not go into graphic design to be a game designer. I went into design brands and websites. Sure. So uh, fortunately, my good friend Hillary Weiss was also in the freelance sphere, and she is a copywriter and had gotten herself in with the coaching and consulting niche. Okay. So she had a client who needed a website and a logo, and the designer that Hillary had, had been working with was completely booked out. She had no bandwidth for this client, and so she reached out to me and said, hey, um, I know that this isn't what you've been doing, but would you be interested in taking on a side project and designing a logo for um, my client, Kendrick? And I thought, yeah, of course. I mean, this is what I need to be doing. Sure. This will be extra money. Maybe maybe this will fund my trip to Burning Man this year. Who sure. knows? Sure. <laughs> no, that's great. So, um, yeah, so I took on the project. It was just a, a side project that I worked on nights and weekends. But the fantastic thing about working with uh, coaches and consultants is that oftentimes they have a following already. Right, so yeah. this first client of mine, Jessica, or excuse me, Kendrick, um, Jessica was my second client, but Kendrick had a program that she had been launching called 10 Women, One Choice. And she enjoyed working with me so much that she included $1,000 worth of my design, uh, my design uh, expertise as part of this high-level coaching package. Oh, very cool. So immediately, immediately I was put in front of 10 women who were in the niche that I wanted to be working with, who wanted logos and branding, and websites. And I was all just put in front of them just from this one client. All it takes is one client. And sure. that's huge. I, I, I had completely forgotten that in this sphere, if you know one person who then can connect you with 10 people, yeah. that's the start of a freelance business right there. That's all you need to plant the seed. Sure. I, I think that you actually bring up something that's really I think important to kind of stress again, like the, the thing, even just with like me doing the show, I basically have kind of partnered with a bunch of PR firms and, and, and of others in, in some big cities across the States that kind of send me guests. Right. And mm -hmm. you, as, and it's the same problem that I think a lot of people have is it's really time consuming to go hustle new clients or new guests or new whatever, right? If you can partner mm -hmm. with somebody that's already kind of made it or has these connections that you can kind of bring a mm -hmm. different skill set to that you can kind of both benefit from working together, you know, you can build a really good kind of brand or business or company or whatever you're looking to do, right? And I think 
That's actually really mm-hmm. good advice, right? Because I think, but I'm curious, how did you meet your writer friend? Like, did, just out of curiosity. Oh, she and I went to college together. So oh, okay. we had some friends in common. And she was also one of the only people who had pursued a freelance career in my entire network of people that I had met in college. Most of them went on to get jobs with corporations or large businesses or startups. And there were very few who went the freelance route and she was just one of them. Um, And she knew that I had, that I had tried to pursue a freelance route um, by working with um, my former business partner. So she knew that I was interested in it. And I think that that was enough to uh, pass me, pass me her client, especially because her client was pretty much just starting out. Right. Um, she had worked as a marketer. Okay. And really, that's 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 where I have found my most success and um, the the best. Uh, the best stronghold within my sphere of influence is by partnering with um, coaches and marketers who make it their living to expand their audience. Sure. And uh, by working with them, it's allowed me to get in front of so many people yeah. that I wouldn't have gotten in front of otherwise because I'm really just now starting to get traction in my own marketing and my own um, – uh, efforts in blogging and Facebook advertising and Instagram marketing. I mean, it's an entire world that I really was able to kind of ignore for a long time because I had so much word of mouth referrals. It was crazy. I mean, my business, I'm, this is my, uh, fourth year as a full-time freelancer. Wow. Congrats. And That's great. yeah. Oh, it's been such a ride. And it's it's taken me four years to really get traction in my own marketing, which is so funny because all this time it's just been successful word of mouth referrals by clients who have their own followings and who are uh, professional marketers or, like you said, PR firms um, who just know the right people and they want to be able to connect their clients or their audience with people who are passionate about what they do. So that's really all it came down to was just being friendly, passionate, and obviously providing good work. Yeah, no, <laughs> I wouldn't have any word of mouth referrals if my stuff sucked. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's good advice, right? Like, you're right. You, that's, that's totally interesting. So uh, you, you kind of covered it quickly, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into kind of what services do you kind of like to provide or, or kind of traditionally provide for your clients? Mm-hmm. So most of the time when clients come to me, they are either just starting out or they are just starting to really um, get traction in their business and okay. make money for the first time. So they either did their website themselves or just don't have any website. Some of my clients are transitioning from uh, the corporate world into uh, the freelance coaching and consulting world. Um, I also work, uh, I, I work with bloggers and entrepreneurs, clothing designers, um, pretty much all across. I, I have clients all across the board. And when I, when I, first get started with a client, my goal is to create their brand look and feel, Uh, create a logo, color scheme, font that I can pass off to them and that they can start creating a cohesive marketing presence with their brand. So a lot of times they've already had a little bit to start with. Um, Maybe they got like a cheapy logo on Fiverr or they did their website themselves themselves using Squarespace, sure. but they're looking for a professional touch. They know that they're not professional designers, right. so they come to me because they've saved up the money and they want to bring a designer on their team. So instead of acting as, um, as sort of like a... a a contractor or subcontractor, I act as a part of their team and I act as the creative director for this new brand. And what, what makes it so exciting is that, you know, a lot of times they, they don't do so well and they decide that they would rather go back into their corporate job. Sometimes that happens. Um, It's all up to them. 
a lot of times they just don't have what it takes to market themselves in a competitive industry, but sometimes they're wildly successful. And I have a few clients who have gone on to make, uh, to gross over a million dollars in their business over the course of a year uh, from running courses and programs or selling products. And it's just absolutely fascinating to see them run their business. And it also goes back into how I run my business. I learn so much from my clients just as much as they learn from me sure. because I, I, I coach them on how to use the materials that I make. So especially right at the beginning, I will tell them how to create consistent graphics. Um, a lot of times they don't have the funding to keep me on board every single month. Sure. So I'll train their virtual assistant on how to create compelling and just beautiful looking marketing graphics using the stuff that I provide as part of our initial package. Sure. And that just gives them enough footing to get started. And once they've really picked up steam and started making money and are ready to expand their business and create new sales pages and uh, new parts of their business for uh, different niches that they're exploring, that's when I come back onto their team. So there's usually a little bit of a gap between the initial project and me coming onto their team as a regular retainer fixture, as a sort of creative director where I have an ongoing role in every single launch, every sales funnel, every piece of their business. No, I, I think that's that makes a lot of sense, right? I think the thing that's interesting about the space is like once a campaign's done, you might not be needed for a couple of months, right? Until the next campaign's mm-hmm. rolling up or or whatever. So no, I, I think that's really good advice. So I'm curious though, obviously you've been doing this successfully for a number of years now. What advice do you kind of give other people looking to freelance or is there any kind of, you know, I know you wrote a blog post about kind of tools and stuff you use and people can go to your website and check that out. But mm-hmm. what kind of advice do you give kind of people that are looking to maybe free get in the freelancing space, whether they're a designer or not? Well, for designers, my biggest piece of advice is to develop a signature style that people will want to invest in. So when people invest in me, it's because they want something bold and bright and eye-catching, but there are a lot of other designers who have like a soft feminine look, and some brands are are drawn more, or some people are drawn more towards that. By developing your own signature style, you're able to stand out from other designers, and people will want to invest in you specifically because of what you've you've done for other clients in the past. But for entrepreneurship in general, the biggest piece of advice, and this is something that I have failed at in the past, and I'm really just now getting getting good at, is just get obsessed with your finances. Know where your money is going. It just doesn't come naturally to a creative person. We sort of uh, have a tendency to like hemorrhage cash, especially (laughs) when you're just starting out and you've gotten a few clients and you're super excited and you just want to buy that high level coach and join all the programs and spend oodles of cash on Facebook advertising. And it's so easy to dive into that. And I mean, there's just a million things to be spending money on once you run your own business. Sure. So by getting obsessed with your finances, knowing exactly how your money is spent, how much money you're paying yourself it really makes a huge difference. And on that note, it, you don't want to rush quitting your full-time job. I actually freelanced part-time for two years oh, wow. while working that game design job before I felt like I had saved enough money to be able to have down months. Right. Because it is sort of feast or famine when you start out, no matter what industry you're in whether you're a copywriter or an advertising strategist or a marketer um, or a virtual assistant, you're going to have some months where people just aren't referring you and people just aren't looking to invest in what you have to offer. 
So having that nest egg to fall back on and having a full-time job to help create that nest egg and, you know, pay off some student debt if that's something that you have to deal with, um, it really matters in the long run. Especially if you're young and you just graduated college and you're excited about jumping into the world of entrepreneurship and traveling and building your own schedule, it is a good idea to have a full-time job for a little bit, especially one that allows you to save money, pay off some debt, and just get your footing in the real world. I made the mistake of jumping right into the world of freelancing as soon as I graduated and I ended up paying for it. Sure. You know, I ended up completely broke and almost having to move back in with my parents. And I don't wish that on anyone. Uh, sometimes the best thing you can do is just dive right into the job market and gain real world, real living experience before transitioning into full time entre- entrepreneurship. No, I 100% agree. I, I think like you don't understand how important experience is until you have experience. That's what I always kind of say to people, <laughs> right? Like, and it sounds kind of stupid, yes. but at least it gets them kind of thinking because you will learn so much about like working at some other company where you're like, Ooh, I really like what they're doing mm-hmm. here, but I can't stand what they're doing mm-hmm. here or this is broken or they mm-hmm. need to fix this or just how to deal with kind of clients or kind of the ups and downs of, of working for clients, you know, and also receiving think, feedback yeah. and criticism. That's a huge one too. Yeah. very. And much. you get that in the corporate world. Yeah. <laughs> no, totally. Right. And then I think the other thing too, mm-hmm. is just, um, also figuring out on building a portfolio, right. Of, of stuff that you've mm, done. I was just going to say that mm-hmm. and it of, takes time to build your own style. Totally. It really takes time to develop your own, uh, unique style and working a full-time job really gives you that space yep. to just relax and figure out what your style is. It's what you contribute to your clients. Uh, ultimately, once once you do, um, you know, go into the the world of freelancing, it, it's what you give your clients. And if you haven't taken the time to develop that, at least five years of just trying out different styles and figuring out what works for you. Mm-hmm. And unless you've done that, then you really can't provide your clients with the high level of design work that they need. They're better off just spending some money on a Squarespace website. No, ultimately. I 100% agree, right? And then you also got to figure out what you enjoy. Like some people enjoy mm-hmm. doing kind of logo stuff print stuff or web stuff or kind of all of that. And and maybe you hate doing one of those or both of those or a couple of those, (laughs) right? Like I, like for example, Mm -hmm. I don't really like doing logo work, right? Like I just, I don't think I'm very good (laughs) at it, but like, right. So like, there's no point in me focusing on trying to build a portfolio of logo work, right? Like I don't want more logo work. Exactly. Go to somebody like Mm -hmm. you, for example, right. To handle that. Right. Um, so, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I think that's also good and you kind of figure out what you like and there'll be probably things that you will end up doing a, a job where you're like, Ooh, I really like this or I don't like this or you kind of get pushed in, in different directions. Right. And I think that's super important. Yes. So, yeah. And especially if you have an agency job, yeah, I mean, fair. you're going to be asked to wear uh, at least a few hats, so you're going to get a taste of what different uh, areas of the industry actually feel like. And sometimes, like, I could have ended up just being a game designer for the rest of my life. That could have been my calling, and I wouldn't have known had I not reached out and applied in the first place. No, I 100% agree. So I'm I'm curious to get your thoughts on, because you've been in the industry a long time, and it's kind of gone through a lot of kind of transitions, and I, I think... I'm just kind of curious to know where you your thoughts are because you've obviously carved out a really good, profitable niche for yourself. But I'm mm-hmm. curious to know kind of where do you kind of see the industry going and, and what do you've been kind of seeing that's happening, kind of good or bad? Well, you know, people ask me, do you feel like your job is going to be obsolete or you're sure. going to lose clients to bots. 
And it's like, well, I'm not really looking to work with the people who are just looking for a template website. It's very easy for people to hop on GoDaddy Website Builder or Weebly or Wix or Squarespace and just design their own website. Um, And those are the people who otherwise wouldn't have a website. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's ultimately finding that niche market of people that really want high level design work. Yeah. That's where the money is. Yeah. And that's where designers are always going to be needed. Um, in fact, if I didn't have to develop anymore and I just did the front end design and didn't have to do the back end yeah, CSS yeah. jQuery development work, then I'd be okay with that. Ultimately, real creative work is not about to be outsourced anytime soon, especially for brands that value originality and uniqueness. Like that is really who's investing in design work in the first place. And when when you think about it, and this is an interesting little statistic, but Wix.com has, I think, 90 million users. But... They only have 500 templates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even though that seems like a lot of templates, if you choose any one of those templates, there is 180,000 people on this planet with your exact template. Yeah. So suddenly your eyes start to gloss over as a, as a customer, as a potential uh, consumer or client. Your eyes gloss over because you've seen the same look and feel on these websites over and over and over again. And they know that, yeah. you, you know, these, the your, right? your potential clients know that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you really, you really can tell the difference between a professionally designed website and logo yeah. to something that's either been hired out on Fiverr for like a hundred dollars um, or something that they've done themselves. Yeah. You know, uh, design skill takes time to build. And with that time comes an increase in value and an increase in price. So people who want value in the look and feel of their brand and their marketing are always going to want to invest in design work. So I'm really not too worried. Um, and I honestly think that these builders are, are a good thing. They're allowing people who otherwise would not have a web presence to get online and to at least test the waters totally. with their businesses yep. for free or at a low cost without having to spend thousands of dollars on a web designer. I think that's fantastic. Yep. It's what allowed me to design my own website way back in the days just after GeoCities. Oh, I yeah. mean, it, it, it allows people to kind of dip their toes into the world of design. And once they do, they start to see how difficult it is. Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> and then they say, okay, I've made a few thousand dollars in my business. I think I'm ready to invest in someone who knows what they're doing. Exactly. Someone who's specialized in this. <laughs> no, I 100% agree. I, and I think the just to like highlight the, the outsourcing part, like in my career – I think I've seen the like offshoring of the offshoring scare two or three times kind of come and go. Right. And I think Uh, (laughs) it's like, sure, go get your first version of your software, Mm -hmm. your site built with Squarespace or, or some offshoring company. But eventually when it becomes kind of a real business, you're going to want, either people in your office or remote or or kind of like on the payroll, maybe not all the time, full time, but like somebody that, you know, you can kind of trust. And I'm not saying outsourcing is bad or I don't mean it to give it in a negative light, but like, you know, especially when you're building software that you're, you have clients paying you monthly for, you need, you know, some people on your team that really understand the platform if you want to, you know, keep the thing up and mm-hmm. make it successful and make changes, right? Where if you outsource mm-hmm. some of that exactly. stuff, you can do it, but it's a headache. And, and you know, like it's a lot of the time, especially in North America, like it's the middle of the night when you're up and vice versa. So are you going to be on the phone yeah. at 3, 4 in the morning? Like these are realities, right? Mm -hmm. That I think people don't think about when they're just like, well, it's so much cheaper to outsource. It's like, well, 
yes, but like you don't. But necessarily... do you want to work with them? Exactly, and it's like the the pros sometimes don't outweigh the cons. And I think as you get to be more of a real business, there's a lot more cons mm-hmm. than pros. And like it's not always about what you're paying them because you know your time's valuable, and if you're working f- during the day and all night, eventually that's not sustainable, right? Exactly. Exactly. And it's also uh, to that point with a small business, you want your team is like your family and you want somebody on your team that you can relate to that understands you as a person and that understands your brand and your business like the back of their hand. Mm -hmm. You want somebody that that is reliable and that actually genuinely cares about your specific business. Totally. And that's why when you hire like, um, like an offshore, like super cheap uh, design or development team, you might not be getting that same experience. And granted, like I'm sure there are teams based in, in India or the Philippines who are fabulous at what sure. they do. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but I can guarantee you that their workload is insane because yeah. it's so rare to find a team like that. Yeah, that yeah. They have so many clients that they're fielding. It's going to be hard for them to feel like a part of your team. Totally. I 100% agree. So yeah, it makes a big difference. Mm-hmm. We're kind of coming to the end of the show, but I really want to kind of cover um, your involvement with the Media Excellence Awards because I, I think, obviously, I've seen your work. You, you did a bunch of design work for, for the recent event, but walk me through kind of your involvement with the Media Excellence Awards. So I am new to the Access Entertainment team. I was connected okay. – uh, to uh, Sarah Miller, the, the head of Axis, through uh, a mutual friend and actually somebody who I worked with at that corporate job. So it's Very interesting cool. that that corporate job ultimately led me to the MEA. Uh, actually, you know, um, sorry, before I, want, I don't want me to interrupt you, but I think you, you touched on something that I was going to mention earlier. Like working at an agency or, or company, one of the best things that I ever did for my career, and it sounds like you would agree with this, is that sometimes the turnover is pretty high. Like, and you know, I worked at an agency for three years. I think like 60 people went through the door. And I don't mean that mean. Mm-hmm. It's just now you have like 60 people out in the world that have moved across the world that you have this network of people. Yeah, sure, you're not like best friends with all of them. But like, you know, just to kind of reinforce your point you just made, like somebody you worked with years ago connected you with something, somebody on an, the opposite coast of where you currently live. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And it's it's just it, being in that office environment and not isolating yourself by working alone as a freelancer right yeah. from the get-go gets you so many interesting types of referrals sure. um, that I never would have thought. I mean, the, the woman who connected me to uh, Access Entertainment was uh, a project manager okay. and she was in the music, the music division of the company I worked for. So she was able to connect me to entertainment clients that, um, and, and it's, it's a fairly new industry for me, sure. but it's also extremely exciting because one of my main goals uh, for last year, um, as well as this year was to kind of break out of the coaching, consulting, small business niche and get into entertainment and have more entertainment clients. Um, so the uh, doing design work for the MEAs was sure. very much a part of that. It was uh, one of the first projects that I was able to take on by collaborating with Sarah and working with Access Entertainment. And I just had so much fun with it. All she said was, here's, Here's a logo that someone put together. You can change it if you want. I kind of like how the Oscars did a sparkle thing. And that's all she (laughs) said. And I was like, done. I almost immediately thought, okay, I have so many assets that I want to incorporate into this brand. And I created slideshow backgrounds, poster designs, and just had it breathe that sort of Oscar sparkle that Sarah had mentioned. Um, and it was really unfortunate that I couldn't go out to the MEAs. I was actually, um, it was a little bit last minute or else I probably would have made the trip. I will be in California in April and we'll be meeting with, with her and her team then. Um, but flying out from New York, uh, last minute was just not, not going to happen, unfortunately. 
Um, though I did, I was able to promote my own business as at the MEAs. I had a, a scrolling poster that was part of the deco. Sure, sure. So no, that's great. That, that was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, it was a great opportunity. I mean, it's just one of those things where opportunity knocks yeah. and you, as a, as an entrepreneur, you have to answer 100% of the time or else you're never going to make progress in your business. No, that's I, I think that's that's really good advice. But sadly, we're out of time. So maybe let's close the show with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and Design Mastermind NYC. Yeah, so I also go by de just Design Mastermind. So if you search on Facebook, um, you can find me. Uh, my website is designmastermind.nyc. And uh, I encourage people, if you have any questions or want to reach out, I have a little chat bot on my website. So I will hear from you if you send me a message there. Uh, and let's see, you can also find me on Instagram and Pinterest. My big three are uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest, um, probably because I'm such a visual person. Sure. So those are Makes the most sense. visual platforms. Um, and yeah, reach out if anybody out there is interested in learning about the world of design. Um, I'd love to chat. Perfect, Laura. Well, I really appreciate taking the time under your day to be on the show and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. Oh, thank you so much, Kevin. You too. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. Also check us out on Facebook at Building the Future Show and follow us on Twitter at Building Show. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.